Um, he directs the UCSF School of Medicine's Memory and Aging Center, where people from around here receive comprehensive clinical evaluations. And he specializes in dementia, and he's got some amazing work, uh, which he's going to review in more detail, um, about what happens with visual creativity in frontotemporal dementia. Now, this is a chance for us to hear from one of the world leaders uh, in research on the brain. Uh, so this is something I've really been looking forward to um, as a topic for us, because we cover so many different types of, of content about aging and about wellness and about you know, what the human body is capable of. And this is one of the emerging fields where so much has happened in neurology in the last 20 years that uh, I'm fascinated to hear what's coming up. So with that, uh, Dr. Miller, uh, welcome. Mic you up real quick. We'll just stick this here. <coughs> and just drop that in your chest pocket maybe? Or Great. You adjust the what? Uh, thanks uh, so much for having me tonight and a uh, very nice introduction. Uh, we do interact with Susan in our program and um, all of the new trainees uh, uh, go through her uh, special uh, unit at the, La can't hear me uh, so well. So a lot of our trainees uh, go through her special uh, unit at the San Francisco General where they learn about some of the bad things that happen when uh, people abuse drugs. and. Uh, uh, I think it's one of the best programs in the world, so th that's, that's how we interact. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk um, uh, about uh, my um, interest, uh, which has been for about 30 years in diagnosis. And I, I think that um, what I saw during uh, the time I started training at UCLA was what I would call the Alzheimerization of dementia. And uh, when I was in med school, I was taught I would never see a case of Alzheimer's disease because it was a rare disorder in people under the age of uh, 65. And then by the time I was, uh, uh, you know, in my fellowship in 1981, all dementia was Alzheimer's disease. It was a massive epidemic. And we, we sort of simplified, uh, you know, I think the process of aging. And I, and I think what I'm going to give you tonight is still a simplification of what uh, happens uh, associated with aging, and um, um, I think we're starting to understand uh, very well that there are a multitude of factors associated with good aging uh, from the cognitive perspective and bad aging. I I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about some of the bad molecules that accumulate that lead to uh, bad aging uh, with different uh, uh, disorders, and um, also. Uh, talk about, uh, you know, things that I think are important to do as we get older uh, to protect the brain. So um, Alzheimer was described uh, by this uh, German neuropsychiatrist in 1906 and he described a, y a young woman with uh, paranoia and uh, memory disorder that was progressive. Uh, and uh, what Alzheimer did is he looked at brains of people who uh, passed away and he, and he saw two very specific changes, the amyloid plaque and the neurofibrillary tangle. And, and um, this is still at the core of all of our um, diagnostic uh, paradigms, but also our arguments. And, and so I think uh, even today there are people who believe that the way that we're going to treat Alzheimer's disease is getting rid of, rid of the beta amyloid plaque. And these are people that we call Baptists, BAP. And then there are other uh, people who believe that the way we're going to get rid of Alzheimer's disease is by treating the neurofibrillary tangle that Alzheimer described. And, and this is uh, uh, constituted of a protein called tau. So we have this religious warfare in uh, my area of science between the Baptists and the Taoists. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit more of a Taoist. But uh, anyways, we're starting to see maybe the end of the Baptist uh, trials. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit where we are with them. Um, they've been very disappointing, very disappointing. and. Um, we're not sure why. Uh, a lot of people say we haven't treated the amyloid early enough. Uh, and once it gets going, there's a cascade that is very, very hard to stop. Um, some people believe that the amyloid is not really at the core of the illness. And I, I'll touch on that a little bit. So th the disease that I spent a lot of time studying, I, I'm not going to talk too much about it tonight because I think it's a 
a little less common than Alzheimer's disease and uh, maybe a little less interest to this group here, but was described by a man named Pick, and it should be called Pick's disease in the same way Alzheimer is called Alzheimer's disease. But uh, in the 1980s, people started messing around with the name, and we're now stuck with a, a less precise term, frontotemporal dementia. Um, but uh, Pick was very, um, very prescient. He, he understood something that I was not taught, and I think even uh, today students are not taught, and, and that is taught, and that is that these diseases are very focal. Uh, and so they don't hit the brain diffusely. Uh, in fact, they um, target very specific circuits in the brain. And this is something that uh, Pick sort of intuitively understand, uh, understood. And he, he described uh, uh, several patients in whom there was a progressive degeneration of the brain that started uh, with a language disorder. And uh, uh, we now call this progressive aphasia. Uh, doesn't have Pick's name either. Um, but uh, uh, as it turns out, these are probably the two major degenerative diseases that affect people under the age of 65. Um, about equally prevalent, uh, uh, so you've never heard of Pick's disease and you've heard a lot about Alzheimer's, but in fact, these two diseases are, are, are pretty much equal, people under the age of 65. After that, I'm, I'm not so sure. So they're, they're, uh, I think the prototypic degenerative diseases, Alzheimer's disease hits the back part of the brain, uh, uh, areas involved with navigating, um, visual spatial abilities, fixing cars, uh, dressing properly, uh, and also memory. Uh, and frontotemporal dementia or Pick's disease hits the front part of the brain. And this is a part of the brain involved with language if it's the left side and social behavior it's, if it's on the right side. So uh, these uh, patients with frontotemporal dementia uh, uh, present in an extraordinary way. They present with uh, disorders of behavior. They become addictive. They uh, have multiple addictions. They don't have one addiction. They become just recently uh, working with a case where they, uh, a woman became addicted to smoking at age 60, uh, drinking. Uh, started uh, 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 to do other uh, addictive things related to her diet, gained 50 pounds. And, and, and so this is a social disorder. And, and for, for me as a, a cognitive scientist, it's very interesting because it's teaching us, you know, what parts of the brain are critical for the carefully nuanced social behavior that you are all exhibiting tonight and have already been exhibited, the turn taking, the, you know, politeness and the questions. Uh, if we had someone with frontotemporal dementia here, it wouldn't happen at all uh, because those social behaviors are disrupted. Um, so that's the other really interesting thing about this disease. If, if it hits the right side, it's social. If it hits the left side, it's, it's language. And so uh, traditionally in medicine, neurosurgeons have talked about uh, uh, the non-eloquent uh, right side of the brain. And so you know, if they take a biopsy, they're more likely to biopsy the right frontal lobe. It's pretty darn eloquent, this part of the brain, and I know that from seeing patients where this part uh, uh, degenerates and, and uh, it totally disrupts social systems. These are people who see marriage counselors because they're not getting along with their, their partner. Their children are alienated because they've lost empathy and sympathy for other people around them. Uh, they've again developed these addictions. Uh, uh, they are disinhibited, sometimes very apathetic. And, and that's driven by these right frontotemporal circuits in the brain. When they go awry, we have a social disaster. So um, we've sort of uh, gone from knowing a lot around uh, the turn of the century, and, and I mean the 19th to the 20th century. And uh, the, uh, there was, an, I, I would call it a dark ages, where we went about 100 years where we didn't learn much more. And so I've just written, you know, uh, here that uh, we knew the pathology of all these diseases. So when the pathologist took the brain out from people who died with Alzheimer's, they saw the plaque and the tangle. When the uh, uh, itinerant neurologist named Louis uh, uh, described Parkinson's disease and dementia with Parkinson's disease, he cut the brain and showed there was something that was called the Louis body now. And so we had all of these pathologic entities that were well described. But what happened, uh, and this was a revolution, I think, uh, and it began with Stan Prusner at UCSF, uh, who's uh, been very influential uh, for me. In 1982, he described a rare disease that uh, we uh, eventually learned was responsible for something called mad cow disease that happened in England. 
Um, and uh, the mad cow uh, epidemic happened uh, when uh, uh, infected beef um, were eaten, and uh, this led to a massive epidemic in young people in England uh, from eating this uh, muscle, uh, muscle meat. Um, but what Stan said, which was revolutionary, was that this was an infection, but it wasn't caused by a bacteria or DNA and RNA. It was caused by a misfolded protein. Totally unaccepted at that time. It was a new biological concept, and so he won the Nobel Prize in 1997 for showing that, and he called this the prion. And I think eventually people pretty much accepted this idea that you didn't need a, a bacteria, you didn't need a, a, a sequence of DNA, but all you needed was uh, one of these misfolded proteins, and, and in the case of the mad cow epidemic, you got them from eating um, uh, this infected beef. This bad protein uh, would uh, aggregate uh, uh, another protein that was normal at the time, it would misfold, and then you would have this terrible, terrible cascade of uh, multiple uh, misfolded prions, is what he called them, uh, that would aggregate within a cell, kill the cell, uh, then spill out into the next neuron and spread across the brain very quickly. So uh, nobody believed that that had anything to do with Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal dementia, uh, Parkinson's disease, Lou Gehrig's disease, but I think increasingly, and Stan, uh, you know, really argued this very strongly uh, in 2009, and, and, and here's what he said. He said, so there was a, a, a patient who had gotten a stem cell uh, injection for Parkinson's disease. So he had uh, terrible progressive uh, Parkinson's disease, got uh, uh, stem cells from a, a donor, they were um, injected into the brain, um, and uh, grew and lived, and for a while this individual did pretty well. Then the Parkinson's got much worse, and, and the patient died. And, and what they discovered in this autopsy was that uh, they, uh, the, the, the tissue that had been injected uh, from a donor had become infected. And so the tissue uh, had Lewy bodies and alpha-synuclein in, in, in it. Um, and that really suggested that uh, you know, that the, the bad proteins from the patient who was sick with Parkinson's had actually infected the graft. Um, and so I think people have begun to study this very intensively, and I think for all of these diseases it could be argued that uh, there is a misfolding of a protein, um, and that starts this bad process, and one misfolded protein aggregates after the next, and, and eventually this is lethal to the brain. So. Um, this is um, a, a very interesting news story that uh, has come out, and, and I think it, it really uh, brings up this idea that uh, these diseases don't start the day before uh, your loved one comes in with memory problems. Um, and so uh, this is a study done by uh, John Morris and Randy Bateman at, at WashU, and, and what they did is they, they took people from all across the country who had a rare form of Alzheimer's disease. It's called autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease. They get a bad gene uh, that affects amyloid processing. Um, if you carry that gene, uh, you will get Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we can predict uh, almost 100% uh, you know, certainty the age. So there's a family in Lamezia Terme, uh, Italy, who carries a mutation, the amyloid precursor protein. If you go back to the records in, in Lamezia Terme, all, back, all the way back into the 1700s, you can see that the people who carried this gene died between 45 and 50. So horribly tragic, but it, it makes this a very tractable uh, way of uh, studying Alzheimer's disease. Because you uh, know that uh, people will become symptomatic around 45 or 50, um, and you can study what happens in the brain before that happens. And obviously the goal of this is to figure out a way of intervening to uh, prevent this from ever occurring. But, but the punchline here was, and, it, you know, and I, I think uh, most of us sort of suspected this, but this is very definitive. And, that, and the story is basically 25 years before these people who carry these autosomal dominant genes actually get sick, there's evidence that the amyloid protein is beginning to deposit in the brain. So uh, this is uh, something that goes on for decades. So first the amyloid uh, begins to aggregate, then there's tau. Uh, then you start to see changes in metabolism with glucose, uh, uh, maybe 15, 10 years before the person is symptomatic, uh, two or three years before the person is symptomatic. If you test them cognitively, you can show some subtle deficits. 
And then finally, at you know, time zero, which is really 25 years after the disease has uh, uh, you know, been uh, going on, we see a, someone with a cognitive disorder. Uh, and so is this what we see only with these rare autosomal dominant forms of Alzheimer's disease? Probably not. Uh, and I think we're learning for other forms of Alzheimer's disease that this story is also true. About 20% of us carry a gene called apolipoprotein E4. We get one from our mom, one from our dad. Uh, if we carry two of those apolipoprotein E4s, uh, the likelihood that we'll get Alzheimer's disease by the time we're uh, about 65 is 80 percent. So it's not a dominant gene, and we have centenarians who are apoE4 who have never gotten sick, but only about 5 to 10 percent of people uh, who live above 80 uh, with that gene are not sick. Um, so in APOE4 carriers, we've learned that if you look at metabolism in young people between ages 20 and 39 uh, and compare people who carry the E4 gene to those who carry the E3 gene or the E2 gene, you're already seeing hypometabolism in the posterior temporal parietal region in E4 carriers. So uh, I think this is a story that has emerged very recently. It's probably true for all these degenerative diseases, and it's sort of changing our, our perspective on how you go at this. I think for many of you in the audience, you're, you know, you're thinking, well, you know, there got to be ways earlier in life uh, that we can prevent these misfolding of proteins. And, you know, I, I think we understand genetics, but we, it's much harder to understand the foods, the vitamins, all of these things that may play a very important role in this uh, in, in people and, and may really, you know, change the trajectory of these diseases. Um, and, uh, but I think it's an important area of research, and I'll, and I'll touch on it a little bit. So here's the way this works, and um, uh, I get to work with some amazing uh, uh, young scientists. And, and, and the idea is that all these degenerative diseases um, have a genetic form, where we know there's genes that cause this uh, with high predictability, other genes that increase the susceptibility that, but don't flat out cause it, uh, and then there's some genes that protect us, and you know, so I think uh, it's pretty clear that there are certain genes that uh, if we carry them, we are much less likely to get Alzheimer's disease. The, uh, most of what we see are sporadic forms, and, and by sporadic, that means we don't know what caused it. It wasn't clearly genetic, it just happened. And that's the majority of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so I think there is a genetic component to it. But there's a lot of big unknown, a big cloud that uh, uh, we don't really understand. The genetic forms, uh, I think, are very uh, malleable uh, in animal models. And so uh, scientists can take the genes that cause Alzheimer's, frontotemporal dementia, Parkinson's disease, knock them into cells, knock them into worms, not knock them into flies, and watch that degenerative process go on, uh, but over a much shorter period of time and allows people to think about ways of preventing these diseases. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, a, a worm, uh, uh, if you modify some of these genes, uh, will ordinarily live uh, about 17 days. If you give them Alzheimer-type genes, they live, uh, you know, 12 or 13 days. If you have a good therapy that works in this model system, you might really have something exciting for human beings. So these diseases, just like John Morris and Randy Bateman have shown for the autosomal dominant diseases in these model systems, go through preclinical. What's happening there? Bad proteins misfolding, aggregating, spreading from one nerve cell to the next. Early symptomatic, what is that? In Alzheimer's, we call it mild cognitive impairment. That means people have trouble you know, remembering things, but they function pretty well. Their function isn't impaired, so we don't call them Alzheimer's. And then finally, they get a symptomatic disease that dramatically disrupts day-to-day uh, -day function. These diseases are fatal. Uh, they shorten lifespan. Um, they uh, progress uh, across specific circuits in the brain, eventually go deep into the brain, into the brain stem, affect breathing, um, uh, you know, cardiovascular system. So they are fatal. Um, I'm going to be more optimistic. Sorry, this is pretty grim. But, uh, you know, I want, I, I want to give you a sense of the magnitude of this problem. Uh, all the diseases are caused by abnormal protein aggregation. This is an exciting idea because if we can figure out a, a way of preventing those proteins from uh, misfolding, from aggregating, we've got a treatment for these uh, uh, disorders. 
Um, and uh, we're just starting to get a little handle on some of the things that lead to protein uh, misfolding. So here's the story, and this is uh, Bill Seeley who works with me, won the MacArthur Genius Award for this work, and it, I think it, 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 it's really telling a very interesting story. So what Bill did is um, he took patients from our clinics who had Alzheimer's, frontotemporal dementia, progressive aphasia, um, and then looked at the atrophy pattern, and then he, he showed what I, I uh, intimated before, that all these diseases hit different parts of the brain. That's why as a clinician, uh, I can diagnose these disorders because I can tell, uh, you know, if someone has Alzheimer's, they're going to have memory problems or certain type of language disorder. So th these diseases hit specific brain regions and their specific atrophy. Th the really smart part of this uh, set of experiments was uh, what I'm going to show next. And, and that is he took young people, uh, put them in an MR scanner, uh, drew the region of interest for all of these uh, diseases. So the area where most degeneration occurred in Alzheimer's is the right angular gyrus. And then ask the question, does the right angular gyrus, when it is active, have other parts of the brain that are active with it? And we've learned, uh, you know, from Bill and uh, other studies that these, these circuits are just turning off constantly, turning off and on. Um, when someone sits in an MRI scanner and shuts their eyes and is told not to think about anything in spe specifically, this posterior circuit activates. We call it the default mode network. What it does is, uh, and imagine yourself with your eyes closed thinking about nothing. What are you doing? You're thinking about the things that happened during the day. You're remembering things that are important and you're throwing out things that aren't. You're planning for the future. So this is the Alzheimer's circuit. This is the circuit that Alzheimer's disease attacks. And, and what Bill showed is that these diseases attack functioning circuits in the brain. Um, and, and I think we think that they attack these functioning circuits because there is misfolding of one protein in that circuit. It begins to spread out from one cell to the next and then eventually devastates this circuit and then in the later stages of the disease moves into other parts of the brain. So that, that, that's this story of uh, network-based neurodegeneration. And um, so I, I, I'm interested in poetry. I, I love Emily Dickinson and I, I was reading one of her poems uh, on decay. And it's so interesting because the poem is about moral decay. Uh, she was very interested in this idea as how does someone become evil? And um, when I was reading this poem, I realized she is not only capturing what happens in real life in front of temporal dementia, because there is this collapse of the moral systems in the brain, uh, because that's where these diseases attack. But it's also really telling us the story of the aging of the brain and neurodegeneration. So crumbling or Alzheimer's disease is not an instant act, a fundamental pause, dilapidation, that's uh, this uh, circuit-specific degeneration, is an organized decay. It is first a cobweb on the soul, and I think of the cobweb of the, as this misfolded protein. A cuticle of dust, so it's very tiny at first, a borer in the axis, so it's beginning to bore into that circuit uh, and spread along it. Uh, an elemental rust. And then so rune is formal devil's work, and this is devil's work. Um, consecutive and slow, fail or, or develop dementia in an instant, no man uh, nor women do, uh, does. It's uh, uh, slipping is crash is lost. So we see the crash, but the slipping has gone on over many, many decades. So just a, a little bit about the prevalence of this. Uh, it's uh, very prevalent. About five million people uh, in the U.S. live with Alzheimer's disease. Statistics say it's the sixth leading cause of death. I actually think uh, it's the third leading cause of death uh, because a lot of times it doesn't end up on a uh, death certificate. So about half the people in a nursing home are there for their cognitive impairment. Um, but on their death certificates, it'll often say pneumonia or something like that. Well, they have pneumonia because this disease has affected their ability to swallow, and uh, uh, that's why they get pneumonia. But be it as it may, I think it's pretty accepted that this is as costly as cancer or heart disease. So uh, whether it's a little less prevalent or not, I'm not so sure. Um, about one in three seniors dies with Alzheimer's or another dementia, Parkinson's dementia. Um, about uh, close to half a million people in the U.S. will die with Alzheimer's disease in 2013. And someone develops Alzheimer's disease every 68 seconds. So this is uh, really a big public health problem. Frontotemporal dementia, which is the other big dementia that I'd say a word or two about today, is, is about as common as Alzheimer's under the age of 60. 
It's probably prevalent in the elderly as well. And, and one of the things that we're learning is that we really simplified what Alzheimer's disease was. And when we look at the brain of someone who's over the age of 85, David Bennett at Rush University has shown, most of these people have vascular changes that are uh, to some extent uh, accounting for their um, cognitive disorder. A lot of them have uh, Parkinson's proteins that are affecting the uh, ability of the brain to function. Some of them have uh, frontotemporal dementia proteins. So I, I think that uh, uh, whether it is a worm where we see uh, at, with aging misfolding of proteins or the human brain, this is, uh, I think, really the major health epidemic uh, of our time. How do we prevent these uh, proteins from aggregating? I think the vascular side, and I think you are all well trained in this, is something that we really can do something about. And you heard the, the talk about uh, exercise, and I'll come back to that. But uh, you know, I think these other protein misfolding stories are, are another part. So j just one comment about prevalence. And so uh, we've recently learned from uh, NFL football players studied uh, by a young woman named Anne McKee at uh, Boston University that um, in some there's a very uh, severe progressive behavioral disorder, uh, bad judgment, irritability, sleep problems, um, addictive behaviors, uh, uh, and this progresses uh, sometimes into Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS, uh, sometimes Parkinson's. Um, and it, it is fatal. And a lot of the football players, uh, it is fatal because of suicide. And you know, this has been um, you know, one of the ways that uh, these individuals have uh, reacted to their illness. And it, it's just a horrible tragedy. Um, and I think Anne has shown that this has got a very specific abnormality in, in protein folding. And I think a lot of us are a little bit worried that some of the veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan may have some variation on this uh, uh, related to roadside bombs and, and possibly other environmental factors that they've been experiencing in, uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. But this is what the brain looks like. And this is the most severe, this is a football player who died of suicide. And uh, uh, this is the most severe uh, aggregation of tau I have ever seen uh, in, in any brain. Um, and it, it, it aggregates in one of the parts of the brain that's involved with fear, the amygdala. So I think a lot of these players, we have an NFL program at UCSF, so I, I see some of these individuals. A lot of them begin um, with anxiety disorders. So I, I think these are things that we've traditionally thought of as primary psychiatric. But in these individuals, that psychiatry is, is telling us that the a degenerative disease that's on its way. And I think over time, once the amygdala gets devastated, they lose fear. They become fearless, and this becomes a behavioral problem on, on its own. So uh, I think a lot about how these proteins affect behavior. Um, it, it, I think it's going to change the way we think about um, post-traumatic stress disorder in our veterans, because probably in the next year, 2013, 2014 maybe, uh, we will be able to image that tau protein. So we are going to be able to tell whether you know, some of these young people coming back from Iraq, people who have suffered uh, you know, multiple uh, uh, head traumas related to football or other sports, may actually be in the beginning stages of one of these uh, uh, tauopathies or degenerative disease. OK, so that's a pessimistic story. That's, that's sort of uh, you know, the protein aspect of it that, that I think a lot about. Um, and you know, one of the things that our basic scientists are working on is, um, how do you diminish the likelihood that tau is going to aggregate? How do you get rid of amyloid? And you know, so I, I think we are devising very smart ways of doing that. Um, uh, I think one of the ways is an antibody. Um, so I, I think you will see in the next year or two antibody studies for people with severe tauopathies. Um, and, and we think that they may be able to clear out these uh, bad proteins. But other approaches are happening uh, as well. So. Um, this is something you think about, I think about. How do you stave off decline? How do you prevent uh, dementia? How do you remain cognitively robust? So here, here's the sort of the conceptual model. And we all think we're in this normal aging uh, you know, part of the, the curve. Uh, when we uh, forget our keys or get lost, uh, sometimes we think maybe we're in that mild cognitive impairment part of the curve. And you know, it happened uh, in our family. Uh, this is a gene. We, we carry a gene that it makes it very likely that we will make, lose, lose something. The likelihood that I will actually bring that home is only 50-50. Even mentioning it, you know, 
course, I did that when I was six, and I was a lot worse at it back then. My son carries that gene, my wife carries a gene, my daughter's a little better, but anyway, so uh, I'm just saying this because a lot of you worry about things that are just you, that are not degenerative disease. But, uh, uh, you know, that said, uh, making that diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment is what we specialize in. We think a lot about it. When have we slipped from really being okay and just us into some sort of degenerative process. Not so easy, not so easy to figure out. Um, okay, so uh, there's a lot of variability in, in uh, what drives degenerative disease. We do lose some things associated with aging. None of us remember as well as we did when we were in our 20s. Um, what that means is we don't learn languages as well, and I mean, I think that's been noted for, uh, you know, decades. In fact, we don't learn accents very well after the age of three. So I think there, you know, there are definitely plasticity changes in the brain that go on over the course of a lifetime. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, some of these affect our memory. In, in particular, uh, when you look at a population of people over the age of 80 or 90, even those that are functionally brilliantly, the memory system is not as robust. This is just, it's not Alzheimer's disease. But this is, uh, you know, one of the factors that we see associated with aging. How do we modify this? So um, uh, this is, um, uh, you know, one, one way to think about this. Uh, you know, here's the corner that uh, we're all looking for. No decline, cognitively healthy. Uh, uh, all of us vary in how much uh, uh, the cognitive decline we have is non-degenerative. I think, as I mentioned, just aging factors that lead to some subtle problems with uh, memory. But then, of course, there are these pathologies that uh, uh, also send us on a different trajectory. And, uh, you know, sorting all that out, we're getting better and better at it. In fact, we're too good at it. We can tell you whether you have an Alzheimer protein in the brain, amyloid, and in a year we'll be able to tell you whether you have tau, but we can't treat it. So uh, it's a real dilemma for us in, in our field. Uh, we have, our diagnostic capabilities have advanced beyond our treatment abilities. Here's some modifiable risk factors, and I don't think any of you would uh, be surprised by this, but I think the data is darn good on, on all of these things. Adiposity and obesity are uh, very potent risk factors for neurodegeneration. Um, when I was at UCLA, I did a study where we uh, saw veterans, uh, they were 70. They'd been studied for uh, 30 years uh, for cardiovascular risk factors, including uh, Stanford Research Institute was the leader of this study. The punchline of our, of our research was that um, uh, adiposity uh, uh, and uh, blood pressure strongly and inversely correlated with brain volume. Uh, at age 40. So if you had adiposity at age 40, hypertension, your brain volume was statistically smaller at age 70. Big, big finding. It's been confirmed by Honolulu Heart Study. So th this is something that I think I think about every day because I've got a little bit too much adiposity and uh, uh, it, it's not trivial. A and I think you heard uh, comment about cancer and exercise. I'm, I'm a strong believer in this. I think this is a very potent risk factor for bad outcomes uh, in the brain. Uh, some of that is vascular risk factors. So I think we know adiposity increases uh, uh, vascular injury. And uh, there is no doubt that uh, once we reach the age of 80, 85, almost every brain we see uh, shows some vascular changes. So I think this is something that you all think about a lot, I think about a lot. It's a modifiable risk factor for uh, neurodegenerative conditions. We are very interested in chronic inflammation, and we can measure it. We uh, look at tumor necrosis factor. We're, uh, a young woman, Bree Betcher, is really honing in on this as a risk factor for bad outcomes. Um, and uh, we have, uh, Bree has uh, just showed me a paper recently where one of the inflammatory factors uh, called interleukin-6, which is part of this pro-inflammation uh, pathway, um, inversely uh, uh, correlates with the volume of your corpus callosum this big white matter track that connects these two large uh, hemispheres. So long interleukin-6 elevations, uh, bad injury to the white matter systems in the brain. Uh, so um, physical exercise, we think, is one of the ways that you break these bad cycles. 
Uh, it diminishes chronic inflammation. Uh, we think it diminishes some of these vascular risk factors, and I think it works on adiposity and obesity as well. Um, Christine Yaffe um, at uh, UCSF, uh, uh, Laura Middleton, did a very nice study that showed that uh, physically active uh, women show less likelihood of cognitive impairment later in life. Um, uh, it doesn't mean that once you've reached 70 that this isn't still important. In fact, it looks like physical act exercise across all, uh, every decade is important for prevention of uh, cognitive impairment. Um, and uh, again, so even women over the age of 70 who didn't exercise uh, showed a higher risk than women who did. So I, I think th this uh, is something, again, we believe in. Physical exercise is very important for uh, preventing neurodegenerative conditions. Is it enough? It's probably not enough for most people, but it's a modifiable risk factor. Um, here's some really interesting animal work. And, you know, this is another fascinating story that I, I, I just really resonate with. Uh, we know there's a, a growth factor in the brain called brain-derived no, uh, neurotrophic factor. Um, and it, uh, this hippocampus, uh, which is where you remember what, where, and when, um, uh, uh, shows massive increases in BDNF uh, when someone uh, mouse exercises. So what this means is that as we exercise, we're stimulating a factor in the brain that is stimulating um, the uh, survival of your memory system. Uh, and, and so this is a, a reason I believe in exercise uh, uh, at least five days a week, serious exercise, exercise enough to uh, increase uh, brain BDNF. Um, and here's some work uh, uh, done a, a number of places, but uh, basically shows that uh, uh, hippocampus um, uh, volume is higher in exercisers than non-exercisers. Uh, hip hippocampus allows you to remember what, where, and when. And this is the major deficit in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so important. Um, so just summary, I'm, I'm sorry I'm pounding on this, but I think it's maybe the best thing we have in dementia, better than all the drugs we have. It, it is really remarkable. Uh, so considerable uh, evidence that you can reap the benefits of exercise at any age. Physical activity, particularly aerobic act activity, is associated with a significant reduction in risk of dementia. Not that, um, you know, uh, Weightlifting and other things isn't as, as powerful. We just don't have as much data on that. Um, exercise reduces vascular risk factors, obesity, inflammatory markers. It improves neuronal uh, function. We think it probably alters brain structure. So that, that's one very positive story uh, that uh, goes with a, you know, the tough story I told earlier. All right, so this is just a little bit of work from Brie Betcher that I sort of uh, intimated about, but uh, uh, she's looked at a protein called C-reactive uh, protein and, and the interleukins, interleukin-6. Um, and uh, this uh, white matter tracts that conduct information across the brain um, are markedly smaller in people who have high levels of these inflammatory factors. Uh, we don't quite yet know how to treat these. Um, you know, I think treating adiposity is, is, is one way, but I think you will see in the next uh, three to five years efforts to lower interleukins, lower C-reactive protein to see whether that changes the tra trajectory of cognitive impairment. Okay. Um, here's this story of uh, being better at diagnosing than we know what to do with. So this is amyloid imaging, and it is now FDA approved. So you can go to a, a radiology center. They can uh, inject a radioactive compound, uh, goes uh, into the amyloid plaque, and we get pretty pictures like this. And, you know, this shows us uh, that you have, the, we think, the precursors of Alzheimer's disease. We don't recommend it uh, because we can't do a darn thing about it yet. Um, but uh, in research, we are learning more and more about this. One of the stories is, again, I sort of hinted at this, the amyloid uh, doesn't necessarily mean you have dementia. Uh, we think this is a precursor of the progression to dementia. So we've learned that about a quarter of people over the age of 75 who are cognitively perfectly normal already show some of this amyloid in the brain. Um, it's frightening, it's also exciting, because I think more and more we are thinking we can target people before they're actually sick and be pretty sure that uh, these people are at high risk for getting Alzheimer's disease. So there's a big study that's uh, being led out of uh, Harvard by a, a woman named Risa Sperling. 
um, and it's called E4. Um, and they're going to use this amyloid uh, uh, antibody technique uh, that looks like it's pretty safe. It's darn expensive, but uh, I, I think it's a proof of concept idea. They're going to take people from the across the country who are in research who show this amyloid positivity but cognitively normal um, and see if giving them an antibody will uh, protect them from going on to developing Alzheimer's disease. Why is she going into that population? She's going into that population because our studies on Alzheimer's uh, disease were horrendous. They just haven't shown any efficacy. Uh, so two possibilities. One is uh, this is never going to work. Um, the other possibility is we got in too late. And so I think this E4 study is exciting because it's going to go after people who are not symptomatic uh, but are, are at high, high risk for developing Alzheimer's disease to see if we can reverse this process. Um, so uh, genetics is really interesting. Um, one of the things that for the first time in my lifetime uh, uh, our researchers have been able to do is study epigenetics. So uh, we know these are the things that happen to our genes based upon our environment. And we can now look at that. We can look at methylation. We can look at lots of factors that go on during the lifetime to see uh, you know, whether they are actually influencing the uh, genetic programs uh, as well. Um, I work with Dan Geshwin at UCLA, uh, who I've worked with since he was a resident and I was a fellow. Um, and uh, Dan is doing whole genome on a lot of our patients. So we're starting to tease out the uh, genes, and it's usually many genes, that increase someone's susceptibility to a degenerative disease. But we're also, for the first time, looking at epigenetic effects uh, and thinking about uh, uh, these many, many, the majority of people with Alzheimer's who don't seem to have a genetic uh, uh, factor. But of course, environment could have played a huge role in these individuals. Um, it's getting cheap. So my guess is uh, in 10 years, I don't think it's too far ahead, you're born, you'll, you'll, you'll not just get your thyroid measured, you'll get your whole genome measured. Uh, why would we do that? Well, it'll only be $100. It'll be a cheap test, a lot cheaper than uh, you know, a lot of the lab tests we have today. Um, and, and we'll be able to say, well, if you take sulfa drugs, you are going to get an allergy. Uh, if you take this, you're going to get sick. And, and I think we'll get more and more sophisticated about this uh, uh, over the next 10 to 20 years. So I, I think, uh, you know, knowing our whole genome is really part of the future of healthcare. It's scary for a lot of people, but I think that's where we're going. Um, okay, so uh, why are genes important? They tell us uh, what disease and diseases we are susceptible to. Uh, we know this from our own families. We know and you know, one family we see lots of heart disease, and another family we see lots of Alzheimer's. Um, there's a clue there about the genes that we carry. It's not the whole story, uh, and there are things that we can do to modify this, but, and I think more and more we will be able to uh, tell people when they're born. And I think our treatment of Alzheimer's disease will begin at birth. So for an ApoE4 carrier, uh, we may have a simple molecule that makes e E4 look a little bit more like E3. Uh, maybe it's a vitamin, we don't know yet. Um, I think these are the sorts of interventions that we're going to be able to make uh, related to the genetic background that we understand. Um, uh, okay. Uh, gene variation produces down, downstream uh, products, so the genes produce these proteins. The apolipoprotein e E4 is a nasty protein. So if you carry apolipoprotein E4 and you play football, uh, the likelihood that you will develop a progressive dementia uh, uh, is much higher than a, a, a fellow football player who doesn't carry the E4. It's that protein. It's the structure of the E4 protein uh, that increases your uh, brain's susceptibility to injury. Uh, and, and so this is very much the story of genetic variation. Okay. So we're learning a lot about risks for these diseases. And, and a, lo a lot of times you'll see someone and there's no history of anything in their family, but all of a sudden we'll see they uh, carry a specific uh, uh, a gene that um, uh, is present in less than 1% of the population. This seems to account for a lot of autism, not all of autism, but uh, it, it looks like these rare variants that uh, uh, some individuals carry um, are disease-causing. 
Uh, and so I think these are not environmental. These are genes that have a high, high effect that are rare, but when you carry them, you can't do very much about them. The common variants that all of us carry uh, tend to show less effect. They don't tend to be disease-causing, but they confer risk. Uh, and I, I think this is what we're sorting out with all of these degenerative conditions. But they have a smaller effect. Uh, and again, I think uh, I uh, environmental factors are also critically important in this story. Here's the APOE uh, story I talked about. So if you look at metabolism in 20-year-olds who are APOE4 carriers, they are already showing this parietal hypometabolism. This is the fingerprint of Alzheimer's disease. This where is where it begins. They don't have bad proteins aggregating yet, there yet, at least that we can measure. But already this APOE4 is causing a metabolic effect in young people. Here's another rare variant. We, we studied a gentleman who was very wealthy, and we were able to think about the disease he has and uh, uh, think about it in a lot of detail. Uh, and uh, he carries a rare variant in tau. Uh, no one knew that it caused toxicity. But when we studied this extensively, we realized in every model system we looked at, this form of tau is bad. It increases the likelihood you'll get Alzheimer's disease. It increases the likelihood that you'll get a frontotemporal dementia. It is a nasty, nasty, rare variant. Uh, everyone who carries it doesn't get sick, but it is, again, a very, very potent risk factor for this disease. So j I just wanted to show you one of the technologies that we're using at UCSF to think about this. So the question was, is this bad, the A152 variant? Well, you could knock it into a mouse, and it could take a long time to d discover. Mice aren't people. But what if we could actually uh, take an individual who carries A152T uh, and turn their skin cells into neurons and see whether they get a degenerative disease in the neurons? Uh, uh, so that's what we did. And this is work from Yadong Wong. And so what he did is he, he took skin cells, and this is uh, Shinya Yamanaka's Nobel Prize, converts them into neurons. Um, and you can see in our A152 uh, T carriers, there is all sorts of red. This is the bad tau protein. So this poor gentleman, poor individuals who carry this gene, have a high likelihood of this tau misfolding, aggregating, spreading across neurons. It's a risk factor. It's a huge, huge risk factor. What if in this gentleman's neurons, he makes a small uh, microscopic change and converts the T into an A. The disease disappears. So uh, this is, I think, really potent proof in this individual that that T is responsible uh, for the disease. And we haven't ever found anyone who's TT. But uh, if you make the neurons TT in cell culture, look at the massive degeneration they have. So I think this is what we are doing systematically with our group at UCLA. We find uh, genetic variants. Is this important or is this not relevant? Uh, we take neurons. We put that uh, uh, one single amino acid change into the neurons. Do they develop a degenerative disease? Uh, if so, I think it's very good evidence that that one single amino acid, uh, a change in one gene, is responsible for the disease. Okay, just a, a little bit of something that's sort of a bee in my bonnet, and, um, and, and this is sort of the demonization of aging that I think goes on in our society. And um, I, I think we're not the only society do, that does it, and I think it's happening more and more across the world. But I think, you know, many si societies value elderly as exceptional. Um, you know, I went into medicine because of my grandparents. They had a huge influence on me. Uh, many of you uh, chose your careers because you admired uh, an elderly person in your family. I think, uh, I think the more we study aging, uh, they're huge strengths. Uh, and if someone is good when they're young, they often get better when they're older. Um, some of the things that we're just beginning to study that are clearly uh, you know, important is generosity increases with aging. Creativity can often increase with aging. And Whatever wisdom is, it seems to increase uh, uh, with aging as well. Um, I've just shown here um, you know, areas of the brain that are involved with emotion. Um, one of my colleagues, Bob Levinson, studies emotion regulation in the laboratory. These areas are, are not hit by the degenerative process. They are really spared. Uh, so aging, uh, uh, many of these diseases, the emotion systems are perfectly well intact. And I think that's the anatomic reason why elderly um, you know, often uh, offer so much to our family units. 
And uh, you know, there, here's a picture of it. This is a study by Bill Seeley. But it basically shows in healthy elderly, uh, you know, these systems work brilliantly. In fact, they may be regulated better than young people. Um, so a lot of the paradigms that Bob Levinson uses in his laboratory, elderly are actually better at. Uh, uh, they're more uh, empathic uh, when they're shown uh, films uh, of people suffering. They, they show more emotional uh, output. Um, so I, I think it's something that, that we have to say and say again um, uh, about our population. That, you know, the elderly are, are not only a problem, but they're an answer to a lot of problems. And uh, I think it's something in neuroscience we have really underestimated. Um, so uh, positive emotions increase and negative emotions decrease with age. So you know, a lot of us are facing a grim future, you know, no matter how optimistic you are. My, my mother's 87 and she's great, but she said, you know, I'm, I'm not looking forward to a great future, you know, and that, that's true. Despite that, you know, um, positive emotions increase as we get older, and I think many of us, including me, realize that. Uh, older adults are more satisfied with their social relationships. Older adults report their highest levels of positive emotion uh, uh, with close others. So this is a whole system in the brain that is being uh, ramped up as we get older. Um, there's a, another, uh, I've been interested in creativity in, in some of my patients. And I, I just sort of marked down some of the people who have done great artistic, creative work later in life or with a neurologic disease. Uh, so O'Neill had some form of Parkinson's disease. He wrote some of his best plays. Could hardly move uh, his uh, fingers. He had such debilitating Parkinson's disease. But the genius of Eugene O'Neill, um, you know, advanced as he got older, despite this degenerative disease. Um, Picasso, Matisse, de Kooning, uh, all of them produced remarkable pieces late, late in life. De Kooning, in the setting of Alzheimer's disease, probably produced his most interesting pieces. Um, the composer Ravel had a form of progressive aphasia, and uh, uh, I think that uh, the uh, piece uh, that he's most no known for, um, uh, uh, it was produced in the setting of the early stages of progressive aphasia. Um, okay, so what can I do? Protect against vascular disease, exercise. Didn't talk about it, but social networks, uh, like the one here tonight, seem to be uh, protective. Uh, David uh, Bennett, a huge study in Chicago, showed that the elderly who were part of social networks uh, in, a, in a prospective study did much better than elderly who were isolated. Um, mental activity, I, I don't understand yet. I hated school, I confess. So the, the idea of going and doing computer games uh, day in, day out uh, to improve my brain doesn't appeal to me very much. But there will be things that are good for the brain. I, I mean, I, I think most of you are revved up so much uh, uh, in terms of mental act activity that I'm not sure how much these computerized games are gonna, uh, games are gonna add, but they might, they might. We just don't have the data yet. And, and then again, I think there are treatable things that uh, cause uh, cognitive disorders, thyroid disease, deficiency of B12. This is something that we measure in every person that we see who has a cognitive disorder. So, um, you know, I think uh, we tend to jump to the worst explanation, but medicines that you've been prescribed sometimes, uh, deficiencies of vitamin, thyroid, these are all things that can make your memory bad that disappear once you take uh, away the bad uh, uh, medicines or the deficiencies that you have. And so I'll end here. This is the Memory and Aging Center, and um, uh, we work on research, education, um, treatment, and um, uh, take care of a lot of patients, and hope to work with all of you. So thank you. Do we have time for a few q &A? Oh, yeah, of course. All right, and any questions, I'll sort of moderate, and then uh, I'll just repeat the question loudly uh, for the mic. Sure, you get the mic. Yeah. Okay, what's your question? It's regarding the possibility that metformin, which which limits which limits uh, amyloid in the liver. Might be a way to aid in the prevention or or reduction of Alzheimer's disease. Furthermore, my wife died a year and a half ago of Alzheimer's, and I made a terrific study. I worked till 4 or 5 a.m. in the morning 
reading reading the the, the scientific papers. And I came away with, with some of the conclusions that A, amyloid might be protecting the brain and not the cause of Alzheimer's. And uh, that it seems that, like in my family, my brother's 94, and he's, he's very sharp, and I'm almost 89. And uh, we, we have somehow inherited the ability to, to avoid some of these pitfalls. And there may be other people out there who have these capabilities. So I think we should, we should find them and find out how their brains are contributing to help us solve this problem. So, so great points. Um, l let me just say a little bit about the insulin um, metformin story. So a um, uh, woman named Susan Kraft has uh, you know, thought that maybe, she's called this the the third uh, diabetes type three. Uh, I don't. I don't quite think that's exactly it, but uh, she thinks that uh, there. Uh, I didn't talk about it, but there's strong links between uh, type two diabetes, probably not type one, but type two diabetes and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, it probably increases your risk about threefold. So we're, we're doing a national study right now uh, to see whether inhalation of insulin uh, will actually um, uh, be uh, protective of the brain. You know, metformin is a, you know, a remarkable uh, uh, compound, and I think it uh, is the only really, uh, other than insulin, you know, great therapy we have against uh, high blood sugar. So I, I think uh, blood sugar is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, uh, and uh, we don't understand exactly how it works, but, uh, you know, uh, we think that the insulin blood sugar story uh, is related to dementia. We, we think that that's a, a factor. Second point you made about amyloid being protective, uh, I think it's a, it's a real possibility. And so, um, uh, one, you know, one reason that our anti-amyloid uh, studies didn't work might be that at least the form of amyloid that we're getting rid of is actually there to protect the brain. I, I think more and more the, the research suggests that it's not these big clumps of amyloid that you can see on the PET scans that are responsible for the cognitive impairment, but it's uh, you know one or two small misfolded uh, you know amyloid uh, beta amyloid proteins within the neuron that haven't aggregated that are responsible. And I think Steve Finkbeiner at, at, at our site has shown with a lot of proteins uh, that actually uh, the if the, if the cell can aggregate in clumps like the amyloid, it actually protects it. So I think your point is, is well taken. Then, then the third point is, uh, you know, about healthy aging. And, you know, I'm more and more interested in that. You know, I think, uh, I think we have a, a cohort of six, 600 uh, healthy elderly uh, in the Bay Area, and we're trying to make it 10,000. Um, uh, so I, I think... You know, we're going to learn a lot more about these diseases from studying people who age well than we do from people who have the diseases. We've learned a lot about the sick, but uh, why do people do so well? That's, uh, you know, a big question. Yeah. Thanks. Quick question from me. Yeah. Have you looked into fungal contributions to amyloid plaques at all? Yeah, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, yeah, uh, for a while there, there was a, uh, some research that... Uh, question whether, you know, um, some of this was not a protein-to-protein -protein aggregation, but, uh, you know, some other sort of uh, infectious agent. Uh, there, there is not a lot of good research in this that I know of. Uh, I mean, I think it's hard to do this research because, you know, getting at the brain has been impossible, and uh, uh, unlike the skin or something else, you can't take a little piece and think about it. Um, but I think uh, with these new IPS uh, uh, technologies, we may really be able to study that and think about that in, in, in a cell culture model. It's, it's a good idea. Yeah. Thanks. We'll go here, then here, then here. This relates to your study of toxins as relative in the, f in the 50s when fluoride came into our water as well as the other 83,000 toxins we have. We get all the mental diseases, ADD, autism, uh, Alzheimer's, and whatnot. H how important is the looking at the toxins in your study of trying to figure out how to avoid it by getting rid of the damn toxins? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good question, and, and you know, we. 
We haven't had really great ways of, I mean, I, I think the thought would be for some of these toxins, and I think there's a lot of interest in lead uh, uh, and uh, other, other toxins that a lot of times they come, they do their damage, and then they leave. And then, you know, we have no way of measuring it. And, and so I think that's, for me, the excitement of epigenetics. So you can take a population of people uh, who have been exposed to something, compare them to a population who weren't exposed to that, and then look at the actual gene itself to see whether there have been modifications. And, and I think that's one of the most exciting things I've seen in, in, in thinking about toxic injury, is this uh, methylation of DNA story. And so I think you'll hear a lot more about this. I think we'll do um, these two more questions um, in the interest of time. How about aluminum? Just ask aluminum. about aluminum. Do you have any comment about aluminum? Yeah. Comments on aluminum. What about aluminum? Yeah. Well, I'll, should I give you the two-minute answer, or is that too long? Two or just an opinion? Uh, okay. So here, here's the story. Here's how it went. Um, uh, there was a study in England. Well, the first studies uh, were done... Um, in Alzheimer's, and they showed that the plaque, that amyloid plaque, was loaded with am, uh, aluminum. And that made a lot, I mean, and, and I will say there was a time in my career when I believed that aluminum was a major factor in Alzheimer's. Then they did a, a, a big study in England where they showed that there was a county in England where um, the aluminum was higher in the water and uh, there was much higher prevalence of uh, Alzheimer's disease. So I, I think things were really starting to come together. And then, you know, two, you know, huge flaws were shown in, in both of those studies. It, it looks like the way that the plaque was stained was bringing aluminum into the plaque. So I, I think most of that early wor work has been refuted. So we don't actually think, uh, you know, th there are some you know, aluminum-related diseases, and I, I saw one, uh, in the 1970s, uh, as a, we, we saw a per, uh, in dialysis patients a progressive dementia uh, that let, was fatal, that was totally related to the aluminum and the dialysate. So, but I don't think, uh, well, so then, then the big study in England, that was where the big mental institution was. So that was where all of the people, uh, you know, with Alzheimer's went. So it was bad science, I think, a lot of the aluminum. And I, I think in the last decade, more and more negatives around aluminum as a cause have come out. Um, so that, that's my opinion. Yeah. Okay, this is going to be our last question. One more. One more. All right, your second to last question. <laughs> so I read that if I learn Chinese, I won't get uh, Alzheimer's. So I'm trying it. What are my chances, Doc? Yeah. <laughs> You're impressive, I'll, I'll tell you that. Uh, my neighbor, John Rubenstein, is learning Chinese, and uh, he's, he's around my age, and he's really learned it. Uh, I, I think it's a great sign. I think if you can learn Chinese, you know, I think you've got a lot of cognitive reserve. I think that's a great uh, thing. I'm not sure the learning of it is protecting your brain. It just tells us you've got a good brain. Yeah. There are two other studies that say if you do it standing on your head underwater, it works better. <laughs> On that level, um, has your group had much experience with working with Michael Mersnick up there at UCSF, and, and what have you noticed? You say that you're not doing too much with cognitive exercises, but what's your thought on that? Michael's about to do, so do, do you know who Michael Mersnick is? Uh, no. Yeah. no. So he, he's a basic scientist, uh, Michael, who, who, who showed that uh, he could change the neuronal um, structure in mice uh, with uh, special auditory type stimulation. So I, I think it was a very exciting set of studies. It showed that, you know, the brain had a lot of plasticity. I was taught that neurons didn't divide. They do divide. You can, you know, really show plasticity. Um, so there's a, you know, well, let me say one real positive thing about mental exercise. So there's the London taxi driver study that shows that uh, the uh, London taxi drivers uh, uh, who, who uh, navigate an incredibly complex uh, set of uh, streets um, actually have a bigger right hippocampus than uh, non-taxi drivers. We think that's what they learn. So it's, you know, a short period of intense mental stimulation related to spatial cognition. So Michael has got uh, a number of uh, games that he's developed, and the, the first ones weren't a lot of fun to take. 
Um, and I think uh, their compliance was an issue. But he's gotten, you know, smart people from this community to work uh, on the games, and they're better and better. And he's about to do a massive study of, you know, 20, uh, I think 30,000 people. Um, and the goal is to see if you play these exercises, whether this will, you know, improve your cognition. And, you know, I think he would agree with me, the jury's out, but it's, it's darn exciting. I mean, I think it is exciting. On that note, please join me in thanking Dr. Miller for taking his time tonight.